Hey there. Thanks for joining us for Tales of Misadventure, a podcast all about business blunders. On this podcast, Nicole Donnelly, founder of DMG Digital, talks to entrepreneurs and learns how they turn their lemons into lemonade. DMG Digital is a content marketing agency focused on helping manufacturers attract new buyers through digital self-serve. Nicole Donnelly is a fourth-generation entrepreneur, a girl mom, and an avid traveler. Now, let's head into a tale of misadventure with your host, Nicole Donnelly. Welcome to Tales of Misadventure, where successful entrepreneurs share their stories of failure and how they turned lemons into lemonade. In today's episode, we are so excited, I am so excited, to host Alec Berkeley, guitarist, husband, future dad, and entrepreneur who is one of the very few who built and sold a successful startup. Alec made waves in the e-commerce world where he co-founded Bundle B2B, a SaaS application that offers enterprise-level B2B functionality to businesses of all sizes. Alec is now the Director of Global Strategy at Big Commerce. Alec, welcome to the show. How are you? I don't deserve I... that. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. It's my pleasure. I've been so excited to have you on the show ever since I met you at the good old MEP conference in Buffalo last month. Mm -hmm. And from that first conversation I had with you, I was like, just enamored by your story. And I was like, I got to have him on the show. He's got a cool story to tell. So how's your week going? It's Friday. How you feeling? It's good. Friday. I'm feeling good. It's been a good week. Um, good. Yeah, I'm happy to happy to be chatting with you hopefully there's some good nuggets in here um i just started listening to this podcast uh gold mines that's hosted by kevin oh. hart where he interviews people much more successful than you could ever imagine so i feel like very uh very fortunate to be you know, uh talking about my small small snippet of e-commerce success uh that that, oh. that has existed so far in, in the universe you're too modest. You're very modest, but no, it's pretty remarkable what you've built considering what 90% of all startups fail. So not only did you, did you build a successful startup, but you sold it. And I just had a live show earlier today with a gentleman, a good friend of mine, Damon Pastolka, who helps businesses sell their business, put together, mm -hmm. a, you know, exit strategy mm -hmm. and everything. And 70% of all people who try to sell their businesses can't sell them. So, and that's only the people who try. So you are in a very elite class of people who not only built a startup, but actually sold it. So I think that's massively a massive accomplishment. And especially at your age, which you're a pretty young dude. So starting yeah. out, you know, just out. I'm just going to like, just build up your ego as much as possible. So by the end of the show, you'll be a massive narcissist. That's my goal. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Narcissist training with Nicole. <laughs> Oh, man. Oh, man. Uh, yeah. Well, so, I mean, where, where to even start, I guess, um, how I even got connected to the other co-founder, Dong, is, is, mm -hmm. is an interesting story. Um, I could maybe start there and then, you know, mm -hmm. see where it goes. So um, I was at Chapman University in Orange County in Southern California. I had a side hustle fixing iPhone screens. At that time, it was like iPhone 4 going into iPhone 5. The iPhone 4s, you had to take it all apart, like from the back, just to get to the screen. It took a really long time. And then when iPhone 5s came out, all you had to do is just pop off the screen and you could do it in like 15 minutes. So really big shift. I don't know if any listeners have ever fixed iPhones before, but when I was in school, particularly in Southern California with a large fraternity and sorority population, I had a lot of clients and that side hustle turned into a pretty successful um, business um, fixing phones. Okay. And um, the, the president of Silk Dong was really impressed with that business that I had started in college and said, hey, you know, I really want you to come and lead our uh, business efforts with Magento. We just became gold partners. And they mm -hmm. were really like in the beginning stages, I think it was 1.2. 1 seven or 1.8 open source. And this was when Magento was owned by eBay. I had no idea what Magento was, but, and at th that time it was kind of the, the leading platform uh, for, for e-commerce businesses and Shopify and big commerce were kind of just starting out. So anyway, yeah, that was, that was kind of where I got my start um, was you know, at a career fair, you know, just walk, I went to just the booth that had the shortest line. There was like Tesla and Google and 
Hulu and all these huge <laughs> companies that had long lines. I was like, I don't want to wait in line. And I'm pretty sure my mom had like called me to like notify me that this thing was even happening like an hour before. So I just like, showed up and meet Don, but we like totally hit it off. And then, yeah, I didn't even really look at any other companies. I said, this e-commerce seems like something that will only grow. And, you know, even though I know nothing about it, I've shopped on Amazon before. And, you know, I felt like that was the right sector um, to bring my entrepreneurial uh, spirit, I guess you could say. Well, definitely shows your, you know, what a visionary that you are, even at that time that you were able to see the market and potential there. Because at that time it was primarily fashion, right? Yep. Retail, it was a lot of B2C. fashion and retail. Yep. Yeah. And so B2B e-commerce was just very nascent at that time. So what a really like, I think, smart and visionary move on your part to be able to see like, hey, there's there's a lot of opportunity here and still to this day. Yeah. And how, how we kind of figured out how to crack the B2B code, I guess you could say, was integration. So there was all of these different ERPs out there. Um, the ones that we were targeting were like SAP Business One, uh, Microsoft mm-hmm. Dynamics, Great Plains, um, Everest, if, if you remember that company. There was like three or four different ERPs that we marketed integrations for uh, with Magento. And yeah. we just got all sorts of leads because there was all of these businesses that were buying into the e-commerce platform as opposed to doing it custom, but had no idea how to integrate that. And that was yeah. just an entire goldmine for us to, to sort of explain because nobody just wants to do integration projects, but that's how you can start a you can start a conversation there. Because that was this was yeah. before I think Soligo was just starting out when they had they had built something very basic connector into NetSuite, and so we we're like, okay, we won't do NetSuite because that's Soligo, but you know we can we can provide a whole lot of other integration solutions. So we yeah. kind of started on the integration side. I remember doing demos with like a virtual server with SAP Business One, and I would restart it before every single call because it was always breaking. But that was. <laughs> That was kind of where we got our start. And then we realized, okay, maybe we could make this a bit more efficient and productize and get out of the integration business because integration platforms can sort of satisfy a lot of that or maybe other companies. But how can we sort of take a lot of these um, B2B tools that we're building on Magento open source and and productize or accelerate um, time to market for a lot of these companies that were asking for the same types of things, quick ordering, quoting, you know, order to cash with you know, invoicing and purchase orders and, and things like that. So kind of brought that into to big commerce and, and the rest is kind of history. So what made you decide you guys wanted to, to go to big commerce? And, but I also have to give a massive shout out to your mom because kudos to your mom. Cause if she hadn't reminded you to go to the health fair, the career where fair, would you be today? the career of the health fair, the <laughs> career fair. if she hadn't reminded you to go to the career fair, where would you be today? I know. <laughs> you know, thank the Lord it's for like opening doors. Thank the, yeah. thank the Lord for overbearing Jewish mothers. Uh, for getting, so getting, I hope, she, I, bet, I bet every time she sees you, she's like, Alec, you owe me. <laughs> oh, uh, I, yeah. I mean, she, she's a, she's a gem. Yeah. Oh, I bet. I bet. Well, tell me more. Like what made you guys decide to move to, to big commerce? Yeah. So at the time, as, as I mentioned, you know, Magento open source was by far the leader. Shopify was get, gaining a lot of momentum really fast, particularly in fashion and retail. Not so much on the B2B side. Big commerce was really interesting to us because both companies approached Silk at the time and said, hey, you know, join our agency program. And you know, we had evaluated both and we felt that big commerce and the approach that they had with like the openness and less, I guess, uh, fashion and retail and more um, non-traditional business types, I guess, um, attracted us to uh, the big commerce platform also maybe being a bigger fish in a smaller pond as opposed to like a lot of agencies were jumping on the Shopify bandwagon trying to, you know, access that rocket ship, which it, it you know. I mean, maybe if we had done both, we would have been 10 times more successful, probably would have, right? But we just decided, you know, we really liked the folks at Big Commerce and their approach. And, you know, Brent, I think, had just came in and he had a really, really good vision um, for the company and like where where Big Commerce was going to go. And so we decided that it made sense to just really lean in first as an agency partner to learn the platform. Mm-hmm. And then after a yeah. couple of years of building up that agency practice and I think there was a couple of initial clients that we had got that were on the larger side, like Harvard Business Publishing, Harvard Business Review was nice. one. Yeah. And then um, Gildan with Gildan Brands was another one, you know, American Apparel, Gold Toe, 
um, Comfort Colors. They, they have a whole umbrella of brands. So a couple of those businesses and doing B2B for them or learning how those businesses wanted to do B2B rather and figuring out right. how we could then solve it on a platform that was rooted in B2C. That was kind of the challenge. And it took years and, of course, many failures um, along the way. <laughs> you know, we definitely signed up for some projects that were we'll just call them overly ambitious uh, projects mm-hmm. in terms of what we could really do um, at the time with, with a big commerce platform. This is before things like Priceless and uh, cart APIs exist where you can override items yeah. in a cart or change pricing based off of different customer groups. So, you know, fundamental things for B2B that were on the roadmap and we were trying to sell with big commerce, basically saying, look, we can do this or we will do this, but also trying to pick up the pieces along the way, knowing that, you know, we were bootstrapping, right? <laughs> so, oh man, bootstrapping. So in hindsight, do you wish you wouldn't have taken on those projects or were those failures critical? They were critical. They were absolutely critical. And, mm-hmm. you know, some of the relationships um, are relationships I still have with, you know, business owners th- to this day. Mm-hmm. Others <laughs> didn't work out as well. <laughs> but all critical to, you know, pushing the vision forward, which was like democracy democratizing, you know, B2B commerce and lowering total mm-hmm. cost ownership, increasing functionality. You know, nobody ever wants to be the first or the guinea pig. I think as a salesperson, knowing that your client is the first one, it's in t- it's, it's tough, right? Yeah. Like, how do you manage that expectation of like product development while also delivering a project and, and doing right by the client? Like that within itself was one of the hardest things. Um, it's a balancing act, right? Oh, I can only imagine because, you know, I own an agency and it's all about client service, client delivery. And so mm-hmm. if you've taken on a project that truthfully, there's so much uncertainty on over what you can do, no right. doubt it's going to take longer than anybody anticipates. There's going to be things that you can't do. And to be on the service side of that, to have to go back to the client and be like, well, uncle, mm-hmm. we can't do this. That's really difficult. But knowing mm-hmm. that you needed to take those steps in order to build the product. And also, though, the fact that you were able to bootstrap it, Mm -hmm. I think is incredibly ingenious because I think so many people in your shoes would have tried to do the whole VC thing and say, hey, let's just get funding. Mm -hmm. What made you decide not to go that route? Why did you decide Uh, you wanted to do it this way? Is it because you needed the customer, you know, feedback to help build it? And tell me more about that approach. Why did you guys decide to bootstrap it? Yeah, I think... Well, first off, I'm very fortunate because um, I I came into an already established agency with developers mm-hmm. and resources, and I was more on the business marketing and mm-hmm. product kind of vision side, I guess you could say, um, not so much like bankrolling the whole thing. Those were <laughs> my other partners. So yeah. I think effectively what we decided was the opportunity was so large that we were willing to take a loss on X number of Mm. projects in order to get this product that we then could grow and scale eventually into a SaaS um, business model and then either sell or continue to to scale and et cetera. Yeah. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Oh man. So So tell me a little bit about like you worked at the agency first and then you founded, you co-founded Bundle B2B with your co-founders. Yeah. So what, so what was that transition like? The, yeah, the, the agency side, the services business is very different than um, the product Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, subscription model business. The mindset shift was you, you have to, I think um, this was something that you had mentioned before. You have to say no a lot, right? There's guardrails. Um, Whereas in the services business, you want to be a yes man or a yes woman, right? Where you're just always Mm -hmm. placating the client. It's a services based model. Oh, you want to build that? I know this might not be the right custom module and you might need this other thing, but if you're going to pay the bill and use your allotted retainer hours toward this, who am I to say that you're not able to do this? You are the one, you're the client you're paying us. You're the client, you're paying the bills. So therefore, um, therefore we will do it where whereby in the subscription software as a service model, you have to be really careful when you say yes, because effectively what you're doing is signing up your product development team to then roll a feature into your core that will then be rolled out to everybody else. So if customer A says, I would really like this custom uh, CPQ feature for my uh, t-shirt business. And Mm -hmm. I feel like, oh, you know, that's good for the t-shirt business, but not good for our, uh, 
you know, industrial distributors that are just trying to, you know, get orders quickly off the shelf and, you know, have inventory constraints and all these other things that we need to focus on. So therefore I will say no, but then I will refer that out to um, the agency business or other agencies, right? It could be Silk, it could be others. I'm going to then say, hey, you can still get that thing done. I would still like you to use our platform for what it can do. Mm -hmm. Just we're not going to build that module for you. It doesn't resonate with our client base this time. That could change, right? So that was the major shift was saying no, but then redirecting that to someone that can say yes, Yes. depends on the price. And then we kind of focus on continuing to build that. What we felt was the core, you know, what started out as maybe 40 or 50% of what one would need that I think ended up being around like 60 or 70% of what maybe a B2B manufacturer distributor would need in terms of the commonly asked features that we had seen from, you know, hundreds of these projects. And I guess you could sort of bifurcate that as, you know, manufacturers and then distributors because the needs are, there's some overlap between the two. And if I'm selling to a business online, there's certain things that everyone's going to need. But then I think within those mm-hmm. two um, different business models, you know, there, there are going to be specific things that then you have to look at, which was another challenge because you're going to, you're going to get a lot of requests that don't make a lot of sense unless you understand the root of where those requests are coming from. And you're then able to relate that to a larger audience. And then you say, yes, I will actually build that because I know distributors do business like that. And I will get mm-hmm. more distributors if I build this thing into my product. And I know, you know, like for, for example, building the quoting tool for a long mm-hmm. time, we didn't have quoting, right? We just, we just didn't have it. But ultimately we had to make the decision to roll that into the product because, Otherwise, they're just going to go buy something else and they'd have to integrate that in our system. And it was going to be too complicated uh, for what they were paying us. It just made more sense to get that feature. So even though it existed in other people's software that was integrated with big commerce, we decided to do it because our clients just didn't want to go to another vendor to get that thing. Right. So that's another sort of, I don't know, example, I guess, and product yeah. development and you know, client requests and requirements and how to scale a business without going underwater, basically. Yes. Especially, you know, because let's be honest, running an agency, it's it's like, it's, it's hard to scale a service business. Margins are tricky compared to, mm-hmm. you know, other businesses. Mm-hmm. But when, you, when you're talking about how you're deciding, deciding to, de- how you were deciding which features you want to add to the product, it sounds like there's just a lot of nuance there is very Mm -hmm. subjective. And there wasn't really like a firm like, okay, this is our list we're going to follow to make sure that this meets the criteria of creating this product, right? Like it was almost like just, you know, you had to kind of like use your best judgment based on the other use cases that you had and just the other other Mm -hmm. situation that you had. Are there certain features that you got requests for that in hindsight, you wish you would have built into the product? That's a really good question. I think a lot of those things have now been since remedied, um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) since built into the product. (laughs) I think one of the major, I wouldn't even call this a feature, but one of the major things that we didn't get to pre-acquisition that now exists was universal compatibility with any big commerce merchant. So the way that we had built the um, software originally was all the code existed inside the big commerce theme. So you had to then customize it all within the theme. And the major release that actually took place earlier this year is now like with the buyer portal, it it can just overlay on top of any big commerce site. So it's no longer reliant on whatever code and everything else Mm -hmm. that they've built to date. They can just now enable B2B login and they have their own like kind of branded buyer portal, right? So it's just a lot more... Mm -hmm accessible and easy to implement. I think because we had the agency business and people that could write code all day, we just never did that because we could, we figured out we could just do it. But that was definitely the thing that needed to be done that has now been done. Mm. That was a major, (laughs) the major like elephant of development work. I think it was almost a year after the acquisition and we, um, you know, John McCann and Micah and, the rest of the team kind of rolled that out first as sort of the, all right, now it's universally available to everyone instead of, hey, it's available if you do all of these things and customize the code, which ultimately wasn't the right model for big commerce. 
overall. So do I wish that we had done it? No, because it would have cost us more than we <laughs> um, But would it have helped a lot? Like, like that was kind of the thing, right? Is Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. Like you have to, like, that's what's magical about this story is that you mm-hmm. bootstrapped it. You have to like make a lot of like judgment calls based on financial need and based on use cases and resources. Mm -hmm. And you're still able to build this amazing product that frankly adds a tremendous, a tremendous amount of value for B2B companies now. So man, if you could like bottle that up somehow and create a framework for other startups on how they go about that process, like (laughs) that would be... yeah. Well, there there have since been there have since been a number of other um, companies that I've seen go from agency to SaaS, and I've I've mm-hmm. spoken with a lot of those founders um, yeah. and owners of those agencies and consulted with them and provided my you know two cents and feedback on making the switch and you know some some have you know gone through with it after speaking with me and others have stayed out of it because they're just like. <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready for that, right? I don't know if I want to do it. So yeah, for sure. Well, I have a, I I just watched something the other day that um, full disclosure, I'm not a big Elon Musk fan. Okay. But I (laughs) saw this quote from him that I just completely related to as a founder. And I, I would love your take on it. He was talking about, someone had asked him if building a business was fun. And he (laughs) said, he's like, anyone who thinks it's not fun to build a business. He said, there's parts of it that are fun, but most of the time it's like, you're staring into the dark abyss and you're eating glass. (laughs) And he said, and I thought it was brilliant. He's like, the dark abyss is that the odds are stacked against you. You don't know. There's no certainty about the future. You have basically a 90% chance of failure and you, it's this Mm. black abyss. You have no idea. And the glass part is that you have to work on all of the problems that the business requires you to work on, not the ones that you want to be working on. And so you're basically just staring into the eating class. And I, I found that to be like, so like I listened to it and I was like, oh my gosh, I totally can relate to this. It is so absolutely true. So what do you think about that? Did you feel like something similar when you were building Bundle B2B or, or do, or do you feel differently? Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I think there are rewarding moments along the way. Yes. Like where you've really like satisfied mm-hmm. a client and they've found yes. tremendous value in that thing that started from nothing, right? And that kind of keeps you going through the tough times, which there are going to be a lot of them. While at the same time, yes, you do have to kind of fill in, like as a partner, as a founder, or whatever your percentage of ownership is, the employees are only going to do as much as they're going to do that you've asked them to do and all of those gaps, which many of them will exist, the partners or founders kind of have to come in and fill all of those gaps. And sometimes, yep. you know, I think that's what, that's when it's really important to choose co-founders that have complementary skill sets and mm. you don't want to have any duplication almost in any category. And to the extent that you do, most likely one of those founders is going to end up eating glass to your point, right? Because it's, they're going to have to fill in for that thing that they really hate doing. <laughs> So for me, I ended up doing a lot on the finance side, um, in the accounting uh-huh. side, because um, Dong is just super technical and product oriented. So I ended up over time doing less and less on the product and the technical side, doing more on like the, the, the finance and the accounting, which I don't necessarily like, but I don't, I don't hate it that much. Like it's mm-hmm. you know, like accounting is accounting. It's, it's, <laughs> you know, but like those types of things, right? That's yeah. such a great p- point about finding founders that have complementary skills. I completely agree with that. And I found that like being a founder, being an entrepreneur is like this combination, this weird combination of intense joy. It's, it's incredibly rewarding and fulfilling combined mm. with like this intense pain and suffering happening often yeah. simultaneously. But like you yeah. feel compelled, like you just... You just, Mm -hmm. it's just so rewarding. And so I think it's just like this interesting and you have to get really uncomfortable or not uncomfortable. You have to get comfortable with the uncertainty, knowing that it's always going to be uncertain and you have to just kind of make peace with nothing's going to be certain. And just for a lot of people, they thrive in that kind of uh, dynamic that said those Mm -hmm. same types of people, if you look at their personal life, not a whole lot is there the majority of the time, right? 
in, in the cases where, where you have a fulfilling outside of work life and you have that, mm-hmm. it's like, wow, how, how have they done this? Right. It's so crazy to think that you can scale this business and take care of this, like your own basically child. And then also have like real children, which for me, it was like, I, I think I could probably do this again if I wasn't, you know, to, to kind of full circle moment to the intro, like wanting to start a family and do all those other things. So I think for, for people that really want to have, you know, like dedicated time and, you know, oh, all I, of that for, for like personal work. things, whatever your passions are, right? Like starting a business and doing that whole thing might not be like, maybe that's why 70% fail is because 70% of people actually don't want to make the sacrifices that are actually needed, the 60, 70, 80 hour weeks um, at yeah. times to, to keep things going right? Or, you know, doing the red eye, meeting with the client, going to another place, like the road warrior kind of life. It's, it's, that's what you need. You got a world tour to, to build a business, um, especially if it operates globally, which ours did. Right. So, yeah. That is such a great point. I love it. And it's really exciting because you're going to be a dad soon. My gosh, you're, you're going to be a, you're going to have a son soon in a couple months, right? Your wife, your wife is pregnant. Yeah. So your yeah. first child, that's months, really... we're, we're preparing the best that we can. I've told <laughs> the, the, the most common talking about like feedback from people, right? The most common piece of feedback is get sleep, get, get your sleep. Yes. But how do you get actually as much as you can? <laughs> Doesn't it reset every day? Like how do you build up a bank of sleep? Like I wish I could <laughs> Like it's vacation time. Like I build this up and then, all right, now I'm going to use all this, you know, sleep uh, now that the kid is here. It's like, no, you can't do that. Yeah. You just got, you got to appreciate the sleep while you have it. So be grateful right. for it. And be then grateful. when the yeah. be th- when the baby comes, you have to just take sleep when you can get it, you right. know, like just sleep when you can it, you're, and just expect you're probably not going to get a full night's sleep for a long time and just make peace mm-hmm. with it. But I'm sure you're used to that. Like, <laughs> so I don't. I can nap. I can nap. My wife can't nap. She just doesn't do it. Um, But she can also function with less sleep than I can. Um, But yeah, yeah, I can basically shut my eyes and be asleep within five minutes at most points throughout the day if I (laughs) I really want to. So yeah, I am lucky in that way. The other thing I would say is tap into that amazing Jewish mother of yours and have her come Mm -hmm. and help as much as humanly possible so that you can get some sleep. That is, and don't hesitate. I remember when I had my first child, I honestly felt guilty about asking for help. I was like, oh no, I got to take care of all this. And no, just ask for help because people want to help and it's better for everyone if you have and can use the help. So we have actually started, we're doing shifts, right? Cause we only oh, have one nice. in this yeah. bedroom. So like uh-huh. we are going to have, <laughs> yeah, I think the first like <laughs> two or three months are pretty much accounted for, but yeah. yes, after that, I think will be then the, the time where, okay. So now who's going to help after three months, right? But I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Oh man. So good. Well, I have like so many more questions for you, Alec. I could like talk Do to it. you all day long. What, um, <laughs> let's talk about Let's talk about manufacturing, which is a very something I'm very, very passionate about. We we work primarily with manufacturers at our agency and and we provide digital marketing services, primarily content marketing. And a lot of our clients are pretty new in terms of like marketing maturity and definitely e-commerce maturity. And we have some that are on the, you know, the further end of that where they have, you know, pretty robust e-commerce stores. And so we work with a mm-hmm. we work across the spectrum. And there's some real challenges for manufacturers to adopt e-commerce because of the complexity of the sales process and that so many of them have custom manufactured products and the yeah. sales teams and distributor and all of that. It's just not as easy as just setting up your t-shirt store and screen printing tees, you know? So mm-hmm. tell me like, what is, what do you think some of the um, biggest challenges that manufacturers have when it comes to e-commerce transformation and how does big commerce's bundle B2B this, you know, the, the, how do you see that really fitting in and filling the gap for that need? Yeah. So it, it is a bit of a moving target, right. As mm-hmm. things evolve and, you know, the, the world kind of changes, right. But like AI mm-hmm. is the you know biggest topic these days. And now we, we just launched this AI like product description tool, which is, which is cool. Ooh. So like, now you can cool. spend less time on product descriptions because robots will do it for you. Right. So yeah. as time passes, you know, there's more and more kind of tools that can help with, with these types mm-hmm. of things, but 
fundamentally, I think, uh, and I've said this many, many times before, um, is like alignment of business um, operating divisions. So primarily it's like the combination of IT, if it's a large enough business to have an IT (laughs) department with um, sales and marketing, right? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, like how do you, how do you do change management? How do you like, (laughs) how do you do that? Right. And it, and it's going to be different depending on really like, what is like, what's the main driver? Like during the pandemic, Mm. it was um, the pandemic was the driver right now. It's uh, it's a little bit different. It's, it's, it's more centered around growth and efficiency and maybe profitability. Right. Um, But of course you have to make investments as a manufacturer, you know, what's the number one thing that I'm going to put all of my money into 90% of the time is the product, right? Because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a manufacturer. I want to keep yeah. building stuff and like innovating and, you know, patents or whatever it is that I'm doing that's so mm. unique. That is the reason why I exist in the first place, right? And then after that, after product, it's like these other things, right? And so it, yeah. it's, after product, what is it, right? It's normally sales, right? Because you're going to sell the product. Then, all right, how do you sell the product? Who do I sell the product to? And that's when, yeah. oh, you know, we're going to hire this poor individual and we're going to we're gonna have them lead the marketing team, right? And I think you have probably the most experience in dealing with these poor individuals that have been, you know, brought in. And it was very apparent, you know, at the MEP conference as well, and like some of these marketing <laughs> folks and, you know, the hands go up. Are you the only one at, at, the manu- at this manufacturer oh, that does marketing or... Are you, do you have a team of two or three? And I think the most that I saw was like three, three people, mm-hmm. right? Which, yeah. which tells you, okay, this is a product and sales led sort of uh, yes. model here. But, um, you know, what is e-commerce, right? That's, that's marketing, that's technology mm-hmm. as, as um, an enabler to sell more product, make more sales or, you know, more education about the product. So what do you need? You need good product data. You need mm-hmm. uh you know, some sort of source of truth for that product information. That's hopefully not your ERP because ERP is really bad at data and asset management and, you know, rich content that Google likes. Right. So, you know, enter PIM, which didn't exist when we started doing this, like, Mm. like product information management systems and digital asset management systems just didn't exist. There was no real need for it. Right. But as a lot of these companies start thinking about like, how do I scale out my global, uh, you know, e-commerce business or my global marketing um, strategy, what, if I'm a manufacturer and I have, you know, map pricing, and I've got this huge distributor network and they're all reselling my products. Where are they going to get my, my product images? Where are they going to get the specs? Yeah. Where are they going to get all the PDFs and um, mm-hmm. all, all of these things that need to be standardized. And then uh, from a language perspective, translated content, right? So mm-hmm. more and more I've found like for manufacturers, you know, that centralized source of truth for really like the rich content and product information that differentiates your product, having that ready is step zero or step one. And, mm-hmm. and, and a lot of the time, like, cause you said, there's various levels of maturity. Yeah. Um, and I think you, Kurt and I were kind of jamming on the idea of like a maturity score for a manufacturer. Yeah. Right. And, mm-hmm. you know, my thoughts were, you know, if you're on the lower end of that maturity you probably just need to centralize all of your information, get it ready to the extent where you can just list a catalog. Forget about pricing and bringing in your distributors, yeah. services, claims mm-hmm. and replacement parts and, you know, sales quoting online and invoice portals, like all that advanced stuff. You can forget about that. Throw it out the window. I just need a catalog. And then I yeah. would like that catalog to be available online. So if somebody is searching for my product, whether that's an end user or distributor, um, they could go and find, you know, the specifications that they need yep. to make sure that they can continue on with their project. Then, you know, maybe it turns into a uh, sales qualified lead from there. You can go about your your business with the offline sales process and then decide at what point, you know, now that you have this data online, you can start bringing sales reps into the e-commerce universe where they might want to leverage some of these more advanced tools that, again, exist on like the maybe higher spectrum of the maturity scale. I love that idea of the maturity scale. I think it's brilliant because I think a lot of times manufacturers that I work with, they just don't understand e-commerce. There's like you mentioned, they're so focused on product and mm-hmm. engineering and sales mm-hmm. and right. e-commerce is like this and marketing in general. It's like this whole mm-hmm. thing that they just don't frankly don't understand. Mm-hmm. And so I think a lot of times what I see with manufacturers is when we're trying to like understand that, you know, they're, they, they're so many of them are want to do e-commerce. They, they see it, they want to do it. They don't realize the complexity of it. So they'll come to a call and they'll show us a website 
of some other competitor's store and they're like, I want that. And you're like, well, wait a second. This site probably cost over a million dollars to build. Like if you look at yeah. the back end of it and this, in order for them to build this, these 10 things needed to have been done first before they could even get there. And you're like right. way like over here. So let's start over yeah. here and then we can baby step it up to there, yeah. you know, like, so I think that that is a really cool point, I think, for manufacturers to really think about is understanding where and for partners, anybody who's working with a manufacturer needs to understand and like kind of like lower the expectations a little bit and be really mm. realistic with them about where they should be starting and taking that crawl. And we say this all the time, but, you know, you, starting here and, and being able to set up an e-commerce solution that will grow with them. Right. That's so mm. important because where they're going to be today it's not going to be where they are in three to four or five years, which is a great thing, right? right? But they also need to understand that it's not a one and done thing. Like once you mm -hmm. build the store, it's, there's ongoing evolution that happens as you're learning from the market and all of that. So anyway, yeah. I could go on and on about that, but I love the maturity yeah. model. Yeah. Like really what are cool. the inputs, you know, I've, I've always, and you know, no perfect formula exists, right? But what, I mean, if, if anyone could do it, it would be you and Kurt, right? To figure out like, what are those inputs? <laughs> like what, what is the line of questioning that will allow us to figure out where you are yeah. and, you know, how yes. to at least, you know, insert the right messaging and solution sort of path based off of that, that progression, right? Because it's going to be so different and it's going to always change as new things are developed like like I said with the AI you know hype and yeah. actual application of it it's it's sort of accelerated a lot of the you know product information product recommendations uh personalization you know a lot of the things that were proprietary like AI driven search right it's exists for a really long time autocomplete right even mm -hmm. uh you know if you are typing on um you know the iPhone you use autocorrect guess what that's using right? So it's exists for a really long time. It's just now become accessible and yeah. like reasonably democratized for, you know, all to kind of, you know, figure out how this applies to you. How do you make this more efficient? Even for marketing too, um, my wife, she's a content writer. And as soon oh, as no I saw- kidding. Yeah, she, she does- Oh, content. is she looking for work? <laughs> Not really While she's long. having the baby, yeah, not 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 at the moment. But um, when when all this stuff started um, getting released, I said, you know, you should start using this because I feel like you might be one of the first ones to be replaced. She's like, oh yeah, you're probably right. So now she does kind of like plug in, you know, a lot of these like generating captions for you know Instagram and TikTok oh, yeah. and you know all of these things. Like just use it, right? Because everybody else is now using it, but you know apply your knowledge to that enhance it from there right if yeah. you're not using it or you can't at least you know get some value out of it then you're starting from a point of uh dis you're, you're at a disadvantage right i think yeah you're absolutely right and we you know we're a content marketing agency we are writing all the time and we leverage mm -hmm. ai all the time to create content and so what the mm -hmm. role has become for the writer is you're basically the editor you know, right. you, instead yes. of, right. And, and it's a beautiful thing. And I, and, and it's in, interesting to see, like, mm -hmm. because of how great the AI tools are now, they, the more that you train them to speak from the voice of whatever, who it, whoever it is that you're writing for, the you props. know, the brand voice, you can feed it all of the information past articles, et cetera, and say, this is all the information about X brand. I want you to take this transcript from this interview and create a blog post, blah, 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 blah. It, the more you point. train it, the better it gets at speaking from that voice. And you yeah. just become the editor and you just basically treat AI like a toddler where you go back and say, actually, I didn't, you didn't get this part right. So I need you to go back and I'm going to ask you to do it this way. And so it's really quite interesting to see how that is going to is playing out and how quickly it's all advancing. And I yeah. think um, it also for like uh, manufacturers getting into e-commerce, it does just like you mentioned, you got to get on now. And it's so true for manufacturers. The longer that you wait to try to start this e-commerce journey, the further behind you're going to be when you yep. get there. So, so it's I, just so Nicole important to get started. Start, hire Nicole today to start training <laughs> AI robots to uh, embody your brand. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But yeah, no, I, I think that's great. So let's talk about the future of B2B e-commerce. All right. 
right. what do you think, like, what are you excited about? What is the future of B2B? I, mean, I guess we've talked a lot about AI, which is going to be a lot of the future, but where do you like, you know, where do you see it going with AI? You mentioned product mm-hmm. descriptions that big commerce recently just rolled that out to be able to, you know, create those mm-hmm. descriptions through AI. But like, what other things are you excited about that you think is going to be cool going ahead, looking ahead? Yeah, there's, there's a lot. And I, th- I could break it out even by category, like mm-hmm. payments as a category. There's so much innovation Ooh. happening in payments and fintech and ba- traditional banking and all mm-hmm. of that. And then there's another category, which is, you know, the the enterprise resource planning and migrating from like on-premise to cloud. Oh, what does that mean for yes. your business? How do you integrate a lot of those core kind of, uh, you know, supplier vendor management, you know, inventory management um, tools with your sales channels to make sure that you can get like better forecasting, quicker turnover of, of inventory and all of that stuff. Um, and then there's sales tools, right? Like, uh, like, like better quoting and invoicing and, uh, mm. you know, cash time, like the, from, from when you send the invoice to when do you receive the money and, you know, decrease, like there's tools and this actually relates back to FinTech a little bit, but there's like tools that you can use, to decrease that time from, you know, when the order is placed, when you receive the money, because, you know, now I have, uh, you know, invoice reminders, or I have a portal that can then, oh. you know, go and, you know, process payments or accepting credit cards, but with L2 or L3 data, which means I get better processing rates because I'm selling to another business or, you know, working with oh. companies for um, in uh, capital, uh, like fu- inventory funding. So I was just at a conference last week. Um, I can't remember the name of the company, but they'll basically like, pay for your inventory if you have a contract with like retailers like target or walmart to like help you because your margins are lower when you sell retail but the retailers want your product and so there's companies that will help fund that turnaround from when you're like they'll buy your inventory to basically like the middleman yeah to go put on the shelves and then you know you of course they're going to take take something a percentage but, that, but you you the risk the financial risk is much financial less risk is less right so tools like that i think are really mm-hmm. unlocking a lot for brands with good products to get them out onto shelves and really test to see oh, okay you know like i can more quickly validate how successful this is going to be because there are these tools now that can get me out into the universe a lot faster more efficiently more cost effectively than maybe has ever existed right mm-hmm. so I don't know if that's a- necessarily the future of B2B, but um, that is like one interesting kind of tool that I saw with like businesses selling into retail, which is technically B2B. It's just big retail is a whole beast within itself, as opposed to in the traditional sense, manufacturers selling to different dealers and, you know, those dealers or regional distributors, then, you know, adding their value yeah. service and installation assembly of those products or whatnot, right? No, I think it's definitely relevant for B2B. It just seems like retail tends to do things first in e-commerce and then it Mm -hmm. makes its way to B2B because, I mean, manufacturers definitely, cash flow is king. So if there's going to be a solution for them where they don't have to worry about trade, yeah, trade capital, things like that, I think Mm -hmm. are really interesting. Um, And there's tools that have been doing that for a while, but I think a lot of businesses, um, they don't want to pay those little like fees um, or things like that to free up the cash. But I think with extended lead times on certain products, like particularly for distributors, you know, they mm-hmm. might they might want to do that. Those types of things. But out, outside of just like trading capital and freeing up cash and these types of tools, mm-hmm. uh, I've, I've always thought like these integration platforms, right? I always mm, go around yes. these I mean, there's so many of them um, out there now, but they they really have come a long way. And I I, I futz around in, in these tools all the time, whether it's, you know, Mercado or Jitterbit or Boomi or uh, uh, Saligo. Um, and I'll go find like the big commerce connector and I'll bring in all of the endpoints and then I'll go, you know, in Acumatica or NetSuite and I'll bring in all that stuff and I'll just start you know, doing stuff like, all right, can I get this data over here? What do I have to do in the middle of, from a business process point of view to then yeah. change this data mapping? And um, I've always like nerded out on that kind of stuff, probably because I was doing demos on these like virtual servers when I was like 21 years old. But these days um, it's, it's pretty interesting to see like, at least in the B2C workflow, how sophisticated it is. 
um, how mm. easy it is to take like a credit card order, push that through to a 3PL, that you know, third party, right, goes and ships it out, updates. Like, I don't even have to do anything as like a, Mm. there's a lot of these companies, a lot of them are on Shopify. Sorry, sorry, big commerce. But a lot of these brands, these D2C brands, all they do is marketing and advertising, right? That's all they have to do. And their hands are off everything else. is automated and they just pay a monthly fee and it's all there. But that's B2C, right? Like you said, that's, that's the model. Like, how do you then take some of those efficiencies of like, yeah. These some of these companies just being like you talk to some people they have no idea about their product a lot of them are in like supplements and like vitamins and unfortunately now huh. pet food but there's a lot of people out there that just kind of target a market because they know how to advertise and they know you know uh, men men at the age between thirty and fifty are going to be looking at uh, you know this type of supplement to improve their Y level of whatever it is, or like this, like mushroom coffee yeah. that I keep seeing ads for yet, I drink regular <laughs> coffee, right? And like drink this coffee mushroom and you're going to be more. I who not, knew there was not, mushroom not coffee. Of, not that type of mushroom, but I guess there's like some, you know, type of energy derived from. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, that's not the point. The point, the point is that I think there's a lot of, a lot of integration efficiency that can happen if these B2B businesses are willing to maybe change or tweak a process and then that can drastically reduce their cost to going online. Right. But I think that change, that's why I was talking about change management and business process, because I think historically a lot of these companies are just, you know, it's, it's worked this way for a really long time. This is, this Mm -hmm. is how it's set up. It's, it's cost effective. I don't want to name any specific legacy ERPs, um, <laughs> but there are a lot of legacy or industry specific ERPs out there that do some of these things really well, whether I'm in, uh, you know, food and Bev or I'm in uh, promotional products or, or any, you know, specific niche industry where I have my requirements that I need. Right. I think as those systems either start to get acquired by the larger conglomerates of SAPs and oracles and others, yeah. or, you know, they go, they go create these cloud versions of their on-premise or older software. I think when it comes to that business process and how, how I can easily get um, APIs and web service calls, you know, faster, more efficient for things like pricing and inventory, yeah. and, you know, orders and invoicing mm-hmm. and accounts receivable um, and, and supplier vendor management accounts payable. Like as all those things in the back office are brought to the current time, which is happening, then like these integration platforms will actually be able to do what they do in the B2C world for B2B. Because now suddenly the core Mm -hmm. is uh, more readily able to be automated into the front end. We're not there yet. And that's going to be probably another decade or two. Um, but yeah, but that as that back office progression continues, these integration platforms are just going to get smarter and smarter. And, you know, yeah. even to go back to AI, right, as a sequence of like taking an order, getting the line items, transferring those line items into a bill of materials, and then exploding mm-hmm. that bill of materials into six different vendors, and then fulfilling that, Gosh. you know, those little robots in between can maybe take what could, could was a six step sequence and just turn it into one. Because now the robot can look at every single line item, decide mm-hmm. what vendor all those match to, and then it push that thing and push that blob into uh, the order management system to then more quickly fulfill it, right? So we've got clients like Uplift Desk that are able to take oh, yeah. an order. I got an with... Uplift Desk. Check That's it right. out. Check out my yeah. Uplift. It's amazing. Shameless I love it. Desk it's a shameless plug. plug. So those, those guys can have like hundreds of custom lines on an order and still ship it out the same day. Right. That's just big comments in that suite with a bunch of custom logic in between. So that bunch of custom logic in between wasn't necessarily easy to do. But I guess my point is it will become easier and easier for that middleware and that custom business process and logic to apply to these more bespoke B2B business processes. Long winded answer, but I think that's the future, truthfully. No, that is, I got to say, that's exciting because I've been in a manufacturer and seen how much manual work happens to process these order. order type products. Oh my right? gosh, like how many hands are touching it and the back and forth between the supplier and, you know, all the of that. The sets of suppliers, right? Because there's many. Yes. 
Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then the lead times and the lead times are different depending on which vendor you're going to. And Mm -hmm. there's someone on the team that has to follow up and make sure and update and all that stuff. And what you just, the picture you just painted seems like a miracle. (laughs) Exciting, right? So so all those suppliers that are higher up the supply chain, what if they're more, uh, you know, more readily providing their inventory and their lead times, then my backend system can actually read that. So I don't have to go and check. You don't have to have someone go and check mm-hmm. that when that's going to be available. And then that but flows. But that requires that an ecosystem down. though, right? Like in order to do mm-hmm. that, your suppliers are going to have to be as advanced as you are when it comes to e-commerce maturity. Or please correct me if I'm wrong. But like I would imagine in order for that to function the way that you're imagining, it would go beyond one company and you would have to get your suppliers on board to be able to adopt that technology too. Yes, totally. Yeah. And, and, you know, for us, right, you know, we can, and I say us as in the context of big commerce now, but usually, Mm -hmm. you know, we start out um, and we'll get somebody maybe a little more forward thinking on the lower, you know, they're a manufacturer, but they're really just like bringing in like four or five different things and like smashing them all together. Sometimes even just putting four or five different finished goods into a bundle and selling the bundle. Right. But as you kind of go up, 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 up that supply chain, you'll find, okay, here's, you know, somebody that's just supplying the steel, right? And they sell to, uh, I don't know, like Boeing, right? For the steel that goes Mm -hmm. onto aircrafts, like think about like Boeing's head of procurement, right? And Mm -hmm. like the types of vendors that they're working with, it's mostly all EDI, right? And EDI, like those types of transactions, that's, that's eventually going to change. I don't know how long, but that's yeah. really old technology. Eventually it will change. And when it does, a lot of these bohemoths that are like top, <laughs> top of the food chain are going to have more accessible data feeds. And then once those okay. data feeds become more accessible, then the downstream folks, maybe the smaller than Boeing folks who don't have the, the means to go set up their whole procurement system with the other uh, system that they've got, like these are, you know, these are, uh, smaller companies now have access to maybe data and information that only was previously available to the larger companies. And you got collective bargaining within that. So I've got all these independent now manufacturers or independent um, companies that, you know, because of the access to the information um, can then, you know, go go and do stuff. Like Alibaba is like one example of that, like B2B marketplace model, right? Where Mm -hmm. you've got all these different, you know, China-based companies. And I think there was a sponsor for the MEP forgot um, the name, but they were kind of trying to do the same thing. It was like a marketplace, mm-hmm. uh, Con- Connex. Was that it? Oh yeah. Connects. Yep. Connects. Yep. For, for the in- internal manufacturing. Great idea. Yep. Okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. Great idea. US based sort of supply chain mm-hmm. connectivity, yep. um, you know, send your data to these guys. And then the other, the other folks will be able to then go and figure out if they can use your products for their projects. And that's kind of, that's, that's mm-hmm. a great vision, right? Um, I, should, I actually still need to follow up with that company. I think that's a great, I think that's a great vision. I think that's a direction. That's a direction that they're headed. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think the vision that you've painted is like very exciting. Like it's, it's super, like I can visualize in my mind how much efficiency that's going to create for the business and so that they can be more profitable and grow and scale much more effectively across mm-hmm. the whole ecosystem, right? And the, the mm-hmm. benefit is going to be obviously to the end customer, which is of course what you want. But right. like, how do you like, how do these, like, I, I got to tell you, I'm in the weeds with these manufacturers that it's just like, it's like a chore to just even get them to just put up their just basic stock items on a store right. and, you know, and then build like just even a simple configurator and you know, how, like, to me, like, I hear that and I'm like, my gosh, how do we get there? Like, how do we get these, there's so many small manufacturers who are just like wanting e-commerce and don't like, you know, that's where I'm like, well, how do we get there, Alec? What do we like? Yeah. I'm rambling. No, I think, I think there's always going to be, yeah. there's always going to be a percentage of the business that will not go online. In some cases yep. it could be, yep. you know, Five percent. In some mm-hmm. cases, it could be ninety-five percent. I want to yeah. focus on what you think, business owner, that could be brought online today. Yep. Even if it's just five percent of the business, and then you look at that yep. percentage of the business, you create a model, and you say, "All right, this this might this might have legs. How can you then apply that 
to the rest of, of the business? Or do you want to create more product lines like this 5% of the business that could then generate more bottom line to your 95% of the business, right? So that's not yeah. to say you have to go and sell finished goods, but you know, simplify it by simplifying your process using tools that are off the shelf already there. Mm -hmm. What does it cost you a couple hundred bucks a month to go and, you know, get a yeah. big comment or even Shopify. I don't, it doesn't matter. Right. Like, cause mm -hmm. I know if you go and buy their thing and you, you test it all out and then you're successful that you'll be in the market for my thing as well. Right. Because it's all, <laughs> kind of, it's all a bit commoditized at the end of the day. I think we have the best, you know, sort of value to investment type solution for those middle what we call middle market so yeah uh, anywhere from you know 10 million to uh 250 million in total sales i think we'll give you the most bang for the buck if you're in b2b and you also want to do direct to consumer you don't want to do direct yeah. consumer you're just b2b i still think we can do it uh, but then you're going to be looking at maybe more expensive platforms you're on the higher end but all of that to say i think look at what's out there right yeah. Don't you want to know? Don't you want to know what's out there? What uh, what these folks are doing? Um, you know, th that's kind of my pitch to 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 these folks, right? And if and if and if they've already agreed, like this is something we should do. I just don't know where to start. That's where I think we need to do a better job, right? Us as a platform, you guys, yeah. service partners, there's service partners, other technology partners. Yeah. At the end of the day, like what we need them to be focused on is building their product, innovating, yeah. you know, creating yes. better, more efficient tools, you know, give me a fancy kitchen sink that washes my dishes. I don't care. Right. You keep focusing on that, which is, you know, innovation on the product side. Let us, you know, figure out where you are in terms of your, your maturity, mm -hmm. what kind of solution stack you have today. You know, a lot of the time, if the conversation ends, oh yeah, our ERP is just so old doesn't have APIs. We don't want to do FTP cron jobs and spend all this money. So we're just going to do an evaluation of Microsoft Dynamics and uh, NetSuite or Acumatica or whatever it is. And then we're going to look at, or if they're, you know, industrial supply, maybe looking at Epicor or Infor, right? And their yeah. solution. And then we'll, we'll circle back on the whole e-commerce thing after we've, you know, transformed our, our, our core business here, which not the best answer for us. Uh, but you know, still steps in the right direction will eventually hit a sales cycle with those companies if they decide they don't want to do the ERP and the e-commerce transformation at once, which we've, of course, I think we've all seen companies trying to do the whole digital oh transformation where they change the back office and the front end at the same time. And it's just, it's just crazy. Crawl, walk, right? run. I swear. I'm like yeah. a huge proponent. I think you hit the nail on the head too. And it's what I've seen with some of our clients is what can you bring? Like, like you said, Start with the few stock items that you can bring online. Manufacturers mm -hmm. are reordering is huge. Everyone's like your right. customers are reordering all the time. Get them to reorder through the platform. Elevate your sales reps to masquerade as the customer and get more yeah. of them to create portal accounts so that they yeah. can be teaching their customers to reorder through the platform rather through the, than through them. Then your sales reps can focus on those really complex orders. And I think exactly. that's what I've seen work really well because manufacturers yep. are so traditional. And so like if you're anytime you're going in and you're trying to, you know, change anything, you got to figure out like what can we preserve? What part of the tradition is really important that we hold on to through this mm. transformation yeah. that we can keep throughout so that they're they're not going to be so like resistant. Mm. And in many mm. of them, like I found that sales rep relationship is like the foundation that that company was built on, right? So, right. and so that they have sales reps don't feel threatened. You have to position it as like, okay, how can we take this store and treat it as a sales admin rather than a threat to you, you know? And that, yeah. and, and that's, I think, a lot of what manufacturers struggle with is like, they see it as a competition that it's going to take their job away when they don't, if, if, if they can realize this is only going to elevate them. Because to your right. point, there are certain sales that are never going to go online. That's a reality. There's mm -hmm. there's going to be complex sales yeah. and manufacturing. Well, I could be wrong. You know what? No, no, you're not. Fifteen years from now, fifteen years from now, call me wrong. and and we'll have a conversation and follow up. And I would love for you to to hold me to the to the what's it called the fire on that and see if I'm still wrong. But you know yeah. there are still there's always going to still be a need for a sales rep. I feel for complex custom. Highly, one hundred percent. It's just the role, the role of the sales rep. This is another, you know, arrow in your quiver, if you will. Right? Yeah. How do you deploy this tool to your? It's 
it's it's the same conversation that we're talking about at every conference to do with AI. Now that everyone's talking about AI, it's like, oh, big conference. How are you guys yeah. using this? How are you, you know, everybody wants to talk about <laughs> how are you using this tool to now make yeah. your business more efficient? It's like, it's the same, it's the same conversation, the same thought process, the same type of, you know, focus on a narrow portion, get some success and then figure out if that can scale out. Right. That's exactly. really what it is. It's the same approach. So true. Think, you just got to yeah, get you, in the game. Yeah. You have a really good point though, because a lot of these manufacturers, they're, they're, uh, they've been in business for decades, sometimes like, you know, a hundred plus yeah. years. So carrying on that tradition, I think is really important. So what, yeah. what from that original kind of tradition, the mission, you know, still mm-hmm. that authenticity of your company holds through in the mm-hmm. digital era. Now that, you know, you're going to be bringing some things into this, you know, digital universe, yeah. right? I think channel conflict is another one that we overlooked. There, yes. There's also the channel conflict component, which mm-hmm. any of any of these manufacturers would call us out on that if we didn't mention it. So we'll say channel conflict is also there. <laughs> but navigating that <laughs> can be done. You can navigate channel conflict, right? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right um, with manufacturers. Um, and the thing is, you've got to respect that tradition. They mm-hmm. built their company successfully to this point using those strategies. So you do have to show mm-hmm. some level of respect for them, mm-hmm. for them to, you show them respect for that and they'll give you respect back, right? Mm-hmm. If you come in and you're just like, this is awful. We got to change it. Like they're going to be like, hold on a second, you know, what's going on? Yeah. We, we know what we're doing here. So yeah. Exactly. anyway, my gosh, if we're already like talking we're, for we're, <laughs> Like I don't even go. I knew, I knew when I booked you for this podcast, it was going to be amazing. I was, and we were going to have so and much you'd fun. You'd get through two of, your, two of your prompts. Yeah, I was looking at your prompts last night. Let's see if we can get through like half of these. Yeah. I know, I'm the worst at that. Everyone's always like, Nicole, you said way too many questions, and we There's never so many get prompts. Them all. We talk for hours we'll with those prompts. <laughs> yeah. Next time we'll but book I... a four hour slot, and we'll we'll cut it up into like <laughs> six different podcasts. Well, uh, let me see. I want to see like what question I, I, I feel like I got it. I got three more questions in me and then I have a lightning round. Okay. How about this? Two more questions and then a lightning round. Are you up for it? Are you up for two I'm more questions it. and a lightning round? Let's okay. All right. So what is something, I like this question. What is something everyone in B2B commerce is talking about that you feel the exact opposite about? That, uh, well, not everybody feels this way. Actually, a lot of people would share my opinion. But um, it's the need for headless, the need for a headless site. I think that's, um, it's I not really that. needed for like the majority of, it, it is needed in, in some global and like international yeah. um, implementations for things like local uh, localization and, you know, payment, shipping, tax, translated, stuff like that. That's where I think headless can be really useful. But for a standalone implementation, I'd like, any agency saying go headless or use this approach is probably uh, not not the I one. I got to tell you, I have a client who is like, you know, a small manufacturing client, sub twenty million, mm-hmm. who worked with an agency who built a headless website for them. Oof! I'm like, what? That makes me cringe. It's I, I I and 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 the thing is, is that. They can't, they can't update, like they can't use it. It's not usable in terms of updating the back end to create. That was the whole just point, embed. right? The whole point was to create something usable, right? Um, yeah, it's, that it's, that's the one that, that grinds my gears the most. Um, yeah. Probably. And I, I feel for them because they spent a buttload of money on this mm-hmm. platform and they're not sophisticated enough, nor do they have, they don't need it. Like, mm-hmm. oh my God. I, yeah, I cringed I, when they, when I found out how much they spent on their, and if you saw their website, it's probably like five pages and I'm, 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 I'm anyway. So I actually agree with you on that point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe, that's so, what I was going to say. Maybe not a lot of people disagree with that, but uh, yeah. maybe a couple years ago when headless was the hype before AI, maybe more people would have disagreed. I don't know. Yeah. Oh man. Okay. So my other question is, okay. I like this one because I have, I suck at this. I say yes to everything. Mm-hmm. What's your advice on how to get better at saying no more often? What do you do to stay disciplined about saying no? Understanding like the value of your time and Mm. how that is really the only thing that you can control in the world is your time is how you spend your time. And that being your most valuable asset will then money. Yes. Understanding the value Mm -hmm. of time and really understanding it. Um, and valuing it will then allow you to 
say no to a lot more things. Mm, that's so true. And I think too, combined with having a very clear vision of mm. what it is that you want to achieve in the world. So knowing what your vision is, right? really like preserving, like cherishing your time and like using those. Yeah, things. your purpose. Yeah, you have to yeah. have, you know, what am I really here to do it? You know, whether that's in the business world or outside of the business world. And then, okay, mm -hmm. given that this is this is my platform. How do I then make sure I'm only spending time on things or 90, whatever the percentage is, I'm going to spend advancing this. And if, if the thing doesn't align with that, then I will then say no. Or if I can't say no, then I'll just punt it uh, way down the road and then <laughs> figure out if there's alignment later on, which there might, might be or might not be, depending on where things go. I love that too, because not everything needs to happen right now. Oh, no. Um, no. So I love that idea of prioritizing in it. And no now doesn't mean a no at never. It just means a no now. Yes. That's yes. great advice, Alec. I, and I think it really speaks to your experience because you've had to say no a lot when you were mm -hmm. building your product. So mm -hmm. I, I love how now, you say Now even at big commerce, I have to say no a lot. Mm -hmm. There's so many yeah. partners that come to us, um, you know, whether technology, mostly technology partners because agency partners, just, you know, we'll take them all. Um, but with technology <laughs> partners... Um, yeah, with technology partners, right? Uh, there's just so many um, tools out there. And to your point, a lot of them are startups. And based off of yeah. the numbers, 70, what, 70% are going to fail. So if you spend time with every yeah. single one of them, knowing that 70% mm -hmm. aren't even going to be around a couple of years from now, then I'm, mm -hmm. I'm doing a disservice to the company by meeting with every single one of them when we already know 70% of them are, are not even going to be there, right? They don't yeah, even have a customer a base. Point. They're just trying, trying to attach to us, um, which... Right, yeah. not a bad move. That was what I did. Right, <laughs> that said. But I'm you know, sure when you yeah. did that, though, you had to prove your value first, and that relationship yeah. built over time. It wasn't like we did we're knocking on their door. Yeah, yeah, we had clients, a lot of clients on the Magento side, right? And so, Big Commerce mm -hmm. is actually courting us a bit. They were courting a lot of Magento partners at the time because it was bet. kind of the new. Yeah the new tool. But um, yeah, these days you can't really get away with that as much. There's too much clutter. It's, there's just so many technology there's companies. There's so many there. platforms. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as long as you don't say no to me, Alec Berkeley, then I'm okay. Never. <laughs> Never. <laughs> nope. Never. I'm just teasing. Oh man. Thank you so much. That was awesome. So we're going to do a quick lightning round. Okay. And right. uh you don't like when I do this lightning round, it doesn't turn it's end up, it ends up not being so lightning. So if it takes you more than a quick second to do it, that's okay. Totally okay. fine. So, okay. but before I do, actually, I forgot to ask this one question because you were talking about knowing your purpose. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you, what do you think your purpose is? Why do you think you're here? What do you feel compelled to do and bring to the world and everything? Like, what is it that drives you now? At this point in my life, it is different than what it was when I was 22, wanting to, uh, you know, make, uh, you know, money, basically, primarily. <laughs> um, at this point, it's yeah. not so much that it's more, um, not that I have all of the answers, but like taking the little that I do know, and now kind of, you know, uh, mm. starting a family and uh, yeah. going through that whole process of, you know, creating wealth in a different way, I think fulfillment, mm. uh, yeah. Fulfillment, yeah. I think. I love that. What I love about that is that your purpose doesn't always need to be the same. It can change. I right. Think that's really important. And but, I love that. Yeah. I think a lot of, a lot of folks I went to um, school with private school, uh, you know, parents had a company um, or they had a, a trust fund um, or, or, or <laughs> yeah. things like this. So they're, they're not, they don't have like as much of a fire motivation to maybe, mm. uh, you know, support themselves, I guess you could say, whereas I did not have either of those things. So I, yeah. I always felt in order to get to this next stage where I guess I am now, mm -hmm. um, I have to build this baseline of, you know, being able to um, sustain um, said, I live in Southern California. So said, yeah, uh, barrier my hometown. To I grew up continue. right near, I grew yeah. up right near where you live. Chapman was right down the street from where my grandfather lived. He lived in Orange Park Acres. Mm -hmm. And I remember I used to work at the front desk of his motel, which was in Anaheim, right across from Disneyland. So I'm very familiar. <laughs> it's a beautiful place. Yeah, so Maybe that's why I feel like you and I get each other so much. Yeah, We're both exactly. from Southern California. 
you know, it's an expensive place to live. I, I mostly uh, surround myself with people that are not from here. Um, I'm sorry, Nicole. Interesting. Um, but it's mostly, <laughs> it's, but you're, it's you're okay. good because you, you left, I right? Left. You grew up here I and left. then left. The people that grow up here and stay, I tend to avoid. Um, <laughs> they just scare me. Um, it's like, wow, you've Why? been here the whole time. It's like, you've never left. Like, oh my God. Um, you've never experienced the four seasons. You've never been cold. No, I'll just show you. Um, I mean, once you do, I mean, you sh- I'm going to show you just, you got to see my outside right now. Look at that. Isn't it beautiful? Oh it's yeah. Gorgeous. I love the, the changing of the colors. I can get on a plane for that. I... <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a true Californian. Yeah, yeah exactly. I'm converted. <laughs> I'm converted. Yeah. Oh, I love your purpose. I think it's beautiful and inspiring. And I think really poignant that you mentioned that this is like after you've gone through built this amazing product and everything, what does it come down to? Like the most important thing to you is your family and building a wonderful full life for your family. Um, Mm -hmm. That there's nothing in life that's going to compare with that. That's it. It's cool. And then, and then I'll probably later on when they're in college, you know, do the, uh, Mm -hmm. do the old entrepreneurship thing again. I think I've seen seen people on the other side of that with the empty nest and I want that. Right. I, like once they once yeah. they leave, I want to go back into the you know riskier you know f- more fun. Oh, I guess you could I say. have no like, doubt you're going to be there. You've already built two successful yeah. companies by age thirty. It's only a matter of time. I'm I'm going to be yeah. watching uh, for yeah, sure. I don't know if I, I can wait that I, long. But we'll see. Yeah, I, I know. After the MEP conference, I was talking to Kurt, and I was like, "That Alec, he's going places. He's already been a lot of places, <laughs> but he's going other places. And I want to just I want to be we'll next see. to him when he goes those places. <laughs> well, we're we're in it." We're in it from, so, from Buffalo, anyway. from the Niagara Falls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll always have Anchor Bar. We'll always have Anchor, Anchor Bar. Bar. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're going to do our lightning round and then I promise I'm going to let you go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and I got, I, you know what? I got to do this real fast because I got one minute. Okay. okay. What's one subject you'd like to learn more about right now? Uh, f- farming. What's your favorite song to play on the guitar? That's a really, really tough one. Um, one of the first songs that was a favorite was uh, Oye Como Va by Carlos Santana. Oh, okay. Um, mm-hmm. If you were a spy, what would your code name be? Berkeley Warbucks. <laughs> <laughs> Although that's not a code name because he's my last name. That's okay. Oh my gosh, I'm dying. Okay, last one. Who is your hero? I have musical heroes and I have business heroes. I'd say on, on the musical side... Um, folks like Eric Clapton, um, mm, yeah. uh, you know, I guess like Paul McCartney, those, yeah. those, uh, Roger Waters. And then on the business side, um, folks like Steve jobs and, mm. you know, others that are really just true entrepreneurs and visionaries. Yeah. Cool. Well, I see you, you've already followed that path. I see you following it again. This has been so one, fun, yeah, Alec. One I just... podcast, sorry, I will. I should. Yeah. I should say uh, it was the Tim Ferriss podcast, the Four Hour Work Week. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. When that first came out, it was like the next level of like Tony Robbins kind of like self help. <laughs> you know, um, that actually helped me a lot with uh, prioritizing time and and uh, yeah. scaling the business. Was listening to that and to the people that he would interview and like morning routines and things like that. Not that he's a hero, but he did have a lot of good nuggets. Impact and th- that was before podcasting was really popular. He was kind of one of the major yeah. major ones. Um, so yeah, shout out Tim Ferriss. I love it. Well, Alec, this is a pleasure. Will you come on the show again sometime? I would love to. It'd be so fun. Awesome. All right. Um, okay. So as we wrap up this episode of Tales of Misadventure, we're reminded that with entrepreneurship, there's no straight path to success. It's the unexpected twists and turns that shape our stories and make them worth telling. So embrace the misadventures in your own life and let them guide you towards your own blessings. Thank you for tuning in. We'll be back soon with more Tales of Misadventure. Tales of Misadventure is produced, edited, and moderated by Julie Bacello with Bacello Media. Music by Marcus Way. Special thanks to our amazing guests and the entire DMG Digital team. Visit us at dmgdigital.io to get access to all our podcast interviews and other helpful resources. And if you'd like to get updates on the latest and greatest, please sign up for our email newsletter. We'll see you next time for another episode of Tales of Misadventure. Until then, keep falling forward.